Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whoever you are, wherever you are. <laughs> um, thank you very much for coming in early for US people and for Tanzania. I know it's the middle of the day, busy, 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 but we are grateful that you are able to come in. So we, we have people from Wananyama. Thank you for coming. Um, we have Dr. Emma, we have Professor Brown, we have Dr. Msambichaka, we have uh, Mr. Prank, we have Dr. Fabian Ngido. Okay, um, I think from Wananyama, whoever sent me um, the slides, I just receive and save it. Hopefully you'll be able to share from your side. I did make you a co-host, but we'll see when it gets to time. But anyway, so thank you very much for coming for the second session of basic fetal monitoring. And we know these two hours does not cover even 2% of what we need to know about fetal monitoring. But we're gonna try to bring it as much as we can, make it as interactive as we can. So today it's just gonna be like um, more of interactive versus lecturing to people. So we have invited, um, Mr. Jafari back uh, with his two case study. We did, these are real case studies. And the purpose of today is to discuss those case study and to learn through if as a provider, whether you're in the US or you're in uh, Tanzania, as a provider, when you see that patient, what exactly are you gonna do with that patient? What information are you gonna be asking about that patient? What are the care are you gonna, um, are you gonna make I mean, what decision are you gonna make for care of that patient? And why did you make those um, decisions? So we're trying to break it down to make sure we can understand. So if that patient shows up in Mwananyema, patient shows up in Buguruni, shows up in uh, Mohimbiri, or show up in North Carolina with Dr. Emma, <laughs> um, at least we have basic care for this patient to cover, regardless of the technology. And that's the reason of this uh, meeting today. So we do have um, Mr. Jafari, as I said, as if um, the lead facilitator, and he was joining in, hopefully we get in there. But then also we have our contributors. Thank you very much for agreeing. <laughs> and then I get asked the questions today as a student. Uh, so we have Professor Bra uh, Michelle Brown. I'm gonna give them like um, one minute each to introduce themselves. So we have, yes, Professor Michelle Brown. We have Dr. Emma Kuwa Mugeri. We have um, Dr. Banera. We have Naima Mushi from uh, Buguruni, and then we have our own very own Mr. Jafari. Hopefully, he's going to show up here. So, to start with, um, I'm going to start letting the contributors um, introduce themselves, and then um, we go back to the case study. And then, so Mr. Jafari is going to be presenting the case study, and then I'll give you the slide as well. I send it to the contributors, and then we let each of you. Uh, provide the care. So this is, there's no competition. <laughs> there's no making other pe person feel uh, faulty. You make the decision for what information you have and then tell us what information are you gonna look for to um, take care of this patient. So the, the care might be different, as I said, depends on the technology and knowledge, skills, experience and whatever. But we want you to give us what you're gonna do with this patient on your own facilities. And then if there's any best practice we can share, then we share and say, okay, if I had that patient in this situation, I would be able to do A, B, C, D. So as I said, um, I'm excited to have this um, starting. So on my screen, um, Professor Michelle Brown, on your face. So if like one minute explain so people know who you are. Okay, good morning, thank you. It's nice to be back with all of you again. And just some background information. I've been a nurse for a really long time always taking care of moms and babies. And I don't know why Dr. Gabon laughs when I say that, but <laughs> You're so I do work with Dr. Gabon. I love, and it. I love it. Anytime when somebody says taking care of moms and babies, I, it just, I feel good when I hear it. <laughs> That's the best thing to do, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I do work with Dr. Gabon and we teach students, we help students and hopefully we are getting them to love moms and babies. So that's a good thing. And um, you know, we talked last week about fetal monitoring and it looks like we're gonna talk about more care this week. So I'm excited about that because I like to hear how other people take care of their moms and babies because we can all learn from each other. So Thank I'm looking you. forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, Professor Brown. Um, Dr. Emma, you're next. 
Yes, thank you again for having me. I'm excited to be here. And uh, yes, I have been practicing obstetrics and gynecology uh, for just over 15 years now. And um, it's a wonderful field and I'm happy to share what I know, but also to learn from you. Uh, yeah, because there's always something you could learn from somebody. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Emma. Um, so Dr. Emma is from North Carolina and uh, Professor Michelle Brown is from Florida. Yay. Okay, <laughs> the next person is uh, Dr. Benella. Hello, everyone. Hi. Uh, I would like to introduce myself and my team here. I'm Dr. Zabin Benella, gynecologist. I've been practicing for the past 10 years as a gynecologist. But today I have my two registrars who worked with me to prepare this presentation. I have Dr. Mugar here. Last time she was, she was in the presentation and I thought that he was, he was. <laughs> Thanks, <And> Dr. Vanera. <laughs> I learned my lesson. <laughs> Go ahead. We have Dr. Anata. He also works with us. She also works with us in the department. We have also Dr. Zimwe, our registrar in the department. So we have three registrars all working in the labor and the Anagoji department in Managamara. So I would allow Minaka to talk with Dr. Mugaro and then Dr. Zimwe. They will be presented for all of them. Uh, hello, everybody. Hi. Hi, my, my name is Dr. Minata. I've been introduced. I work here as a registrar in the object guy department. And I'm ready to learn today. And hopefully, we will benefit from our presentation that we have prepared. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello. Hi. My name is Dr. Mugaru. I'll be joining you in the presentation and sharing our experiences according to practice and how we're practicing here and how other people are practicing. So we're hoping through this, we will exchange experiences and learn a lot of lessons from us. Thank you very much, Dr. Mugaru. Hello, I'm Dr. Zimwe. I've been here working in neighborhood for almost two years. So, uh, hopefully, uh, we benefit from the presentation and to get new knowledge for better practice in our department. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, so, here are the others have joined through their phones. They are not with us, they are in the different departments. I think. Okay. They, yes. Yeah, so after the, after the meeting, if you can give. Yeah. Dr. Akida is in me and some others from the pediatric department. Oh, okay. Perfect. Yeah, so um, after the meeting, then if you can give us the names for people who are um, joining remotely somewhere else, if they didn't log in on themselves, so we can count and have accurate details for how many people are coming in. I can see Mwananyama today. You make us very proud. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Um, is Miss Neymar here? You're next. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So we were just introducing ourselves like one minute or so, and then um, we're going to give it back to you. So go ahead. Hi, everyone. Hi. Yeah, uh, my name is Jafari Rutavi, and uh, as a midwife, and I'm also a, a facilitator for today's session, and I hope so we'll be together and enjoy the session as well. So you're most welcome. Thank you very much. And we're looking forward to learn from your cases because I got so many questions. <laughs> so
since I uh, was purposefully set okay. up that way, so you can be interjecting the information people are looking for. So as I explained before, I know you uh, you had other things to do in the beginning. As I explained today's um, yeah. presentation, or pre today's training is, you're gonna read um, the slide of the um, case study, one of them, and then let every person chime in, ask you the questions that are missing, and then you fill in the blanks, and then you share the strips that then the care was offered on that patient and then bring back to um, individuals, um, the contributors to jump in and offer their um, best practice. And then we continue with that. So, and I, I, when I send um, the slides, it has those pause and um, because I'm gonna give you the screen to share with everybody else. And if there's any issue, then I mean, I have my screen also ready to go for the same thing. So uh, before I let you start, um, I see Ms. Neymar just working um, from Bugurun. Ms. Neymar, just say hi and then um, and introduce yourself and then Mr. Jafar is gonna continue. Ms. Neymar, are you there? I saw her logging in on my screen, but... No. But anyway, um, my name is Dr. Hayat Gabone, and I'm excited to um, um, facilitate this from the side <laughs> and monitor all the discussion. That's great. Um, so I am going to let um, Mr. Jafari to take over. So I did make you the uh, course so you can share the screen and start with the first um, slide, which is the case number three. Um, okay. Or do you want me to share and then you can talk over it? Because I know. You're freezing up. <laughs> Mr. Jafari? Okay. I am going to share this screen. And then I'm gonna um, okay. So now, Mr. Jafari was supposed to speak, but I think in the network or something is um, going on. But I'm gonna just read through it. But um, all the co contributors have received this um, case study. Okay, we already said that our contributors today is Dr. Um, Zave Benela, who, uh, who brought his team there, and then Dr. Uh, Emma Kuramugeni from North Carolina, Ms. Nema Mush. Hopefully when she comes in, we let her say hi. Um, I think she's logging in again. Um, Professor Brown from Florida. So this is the, um, the pictures, you see them again when you start talking. So the case study number three. So this case involved a 35 year old Gravida 6 para 5005 who presented to the emergency department at 38 weeks in four days, weeks gestation with contraction every 10 minutes. She had not received any prenatal care with this current pregnancy. And we love these patients like that. <laughs> Makes us think. And then her obstetric <laughs> history was significant for um, the first pregnancy was gestation diabetes with medication dependent. The fourth pregnancy was gestation diabetes again with um, non medication dependent. Um, the fifth pregnancy was diabetic non medication dependent and preeclampsia with induction of labor at 37 weeks gestation. She denies headache, visual changes, right upper quadrant, and shortness of breath. Bad pressure was 210. They range, so the systolic bad pressure was 210 to 220, and the diastolic was 110. And then the heart rate was 56, respiration was uh, normal. And this um, cerevagin exam on the admission was three centimeters, 30% um, effaced, and minus three. And we know they're very, very high. Everybody who knows that they're coming to be induced, these patients, um, it's a minus three, then you have to work so hard to bring that baby down. Anyway, at the bedside, the ultrasound was confirmed a viable fetus with a vertex presentation. Uh, so we hopefully it's going to deliver this baby vaginally and then measurement consistent with the gestational age at 35. Okay, so 
with uh, this patient as a nurse or as a doctor, what information do you need to know about this patient and what information do you need to, I mean, what the, the uh, thought process? I'm gonna start with Dr. Emma. This is your patient. Wow, okay, so um, I think what's jumping out at me is the ele very elevated blood pressure. Mm -hmm. 210, I think you said uh, that's in the severe range blood pressure. Uh, so first of all, I'd want to know what is her height and her weight. Uh, and so I want, I'm wondering what is her BMI and is the appropriate cuff for her arm size being used? You know, sometimes you could use a small cuff for a very large lady and then it falsely gives you a very elevated pressure. So I would want to know uh, what is her body mass index and is the correct uh, blood pressure cuff being used? to get her blood pressure. Okay, and anything else? Because I'm, I'm gonna jot down and then we'll let uh, Mr. Jafari um, answer this question in combining for the answers from everybody else. Yes, anything else for that case before I go to the next person? Other than the uh, BMI and pressure cuff? I would also wanna know, I mean, is this patient, has she ever been on blood pressure medication before? Is this uh, blood pressure a new issue? Or is this something that she has had before? And was she taking any medication for this to control the blood pressures? Mm -hmm. uh, I would also want to know what, how does the baby look at this stage? If mom is having severe range blood pressures, uh, how does the mom look? Um, so that's where I would start at. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to let um, the next standpoint, you are admitting this patient. Um, is my name Mamush? She doesn't have a mic. Um, Professor Brown, those good days that you started working as an <laughs> labor and labor nurse. This is a patient that she's telling you and you're doing those vital signs and you need to notify uh, Dr. Emma about this patient and she has those questions for you. What are the things that you, as a nurse you think when taking care of this patient or admitting this patient? Well, admitting this patient, you know, it, definitely look carefully at her history. And she was preeclamptic with her last pregnancy. So does she know if that high blood pressure continued or did it just come back with a pregnancy? And certainly I would wanna make sure that the cuff size is correct as Dr. Emma pointed out, so that we're getting the right numbers. And while I'm doing all of this admission vital signs and blood work, because we she hasn't had prenatal care, so we would have a lot of blood work that we'd want to do, I would also be working very hard to develop a relationship with her, to keep her calm, make sure that we are putting in place um, how do we treat preeclampsia that we would want a calm atmosphere, quiet atmosphere, dim the lights, and just start that off right away to see if we could get the patient to relax and help bring her blood pressure down a little bit. Okay, thank you. So, for example, since you are looking for the history, what kind of a question are you going to ask this patient? So yeah, but you know that her previous, yeah, previous pregnancies, yes, she has a history of preeclampsia and now she comes out with that high blood pressure. And of course you fix the blood pressure, for example. What other things are you gonna ask this patient to get more information to help you with your care? Well, I wanna know, you know, has she seen a physician since her last pregnancy? What's her blood pressure been doing? How has she been feeling? Does she have any headaches? Does she have any visual disturbances? I would be carefully checking her reflexes. And then I would want to know some history about her other pregnancies. You know, how big were her babies? Did she deliver vaginally? Was she a C-section? Did she have a C-section? And then looking at the gestational diabetes that she also has a history of, we would want to follow that closely too with some, you know, checking her blood sugar and just determining, are we gonna have any problems with her blood sugar in addition to the blood pressure? Uh, we do have, the baby is doing fine now. It says a viable baby. 
gestational age of 35 weeks, but she thinks she's further along than that. Says she was 38 and a half weeks when she came in. So we know that there's maybe some growth restriction with the baby. So we wanna monitor the baby very closely to see what's going on with that baby because the baby does have some risk factors now working against it. It has the high blood pressure and possibly the high blood sugar. So we definitely wanna keep a close eye on the baby also. This isn't somebody that we're gonna let get up and walk around a lot in labor. They're gonna to have to be in bed, very closely monitored, whether it's on a fetal monitor, if you have it, or listening very closely with a Doppler. Okay, excellent. Okay, I'm gonna transfer that part to um, Dr. Banera, whoever wants to start, that would be great. Did you want me to pull your talking points? Oh, we will just explain them. Okay, that's fine. Go for it. Thank you. Yes. So, uh, according to our discussion, there were some things you wanted to know from the history, and there were some, some things you wanted to know in the examination of the patient. From the history, first we would want to know what was the complaint that made her attend EMD. Maybe she had had some episode of convulsion and loss of consciousness, we would be interested to know. We would also want to know the postpartum care during the last delivery, as, as Sister Michelle has explained. We would want to know, did the blood pressure subside, go back to normal post-delivery, was she monitored, was she on under any medications post-delivery? We would also want to know if she has any other maybe metabolic disease because her pregnancy history has is positive for multiple gestational diabetes and preeclampsia. So we would want to know if she has had any metabolic issues. And we were, would also be interested on why she has not attended antenatal care. That would probably tell us in the follow-up post this delivery, we, we could speculate what challenges she would face post delivery follow-up. There would be the same challenges why she did not attend antenatal care. So those would be the things we asked in our history. Then in examination, we thought we, apart from just blood pressure, there are other things that we need to, to watch in any woman who is going to deliver. So we want to know the power. And because the blood pressure is also in the higher end, we want to establish, maybe she has some complications such as health syndrome. So we want to know if she's jaundice, she has any petite or purpura. We want to know that from her examination. Uh, we also want to assess the features closely uh, by monitoring the fetal heart rate, as we've already seen in the ultrasounds. If there's a possibility of either wrong dates or IGR, we would monitor closely the features. Uh, apart from that, after rupture of the membranes, we want to know the like uh, with this pressure, the baby could be in distress. So we also want to know if the, there's any meconium stain in the lichen. Uh, yes, that is all we want to know. And we also want to know her RBG and her urine lipstick for ketones and for protein. Very good. Um, Dr. Um, Emma, did I see you raise your hands or my, just my imagination? <laughs> uh, no, I did not raise my hand. Okay. <laughs> I think somebody was coming in and he was next to you. So I thought it was, um, I know Ms. Neymar Mush, unfortunately, she doesn't have an audio, so that's okay. Um, Ms. Neymar, you can write um, on the chat, you can write your comments there, and then I can read it as we go back to uh, this question. So Mr. Jafari, um, if you can see, we do have the feedback from Dr. Emma Mugheli, we have Professor Brown, and we have the group from uh, Monanyama asking or anticipating um, care for this patient, for that limited information those so they have. So can you give us a little background on this patient answering those questions? I'm not sure if you heard all of them, 
Um, I mean, I can give you probably a quick brief um, summary is from Dr. Emma. Um, she was asking about the, um, if the patient, uh, what was the BMI for this patient uh, with the, blood, the right blood pressure cuff used since the blood pressure range, uh, they were in high range or severe range. Uh, was the patient in, on medication like an antihypertensive medication? Was the baby okay? Monitoring wise um, from Professor Michelle Brown, the same thing, cuff size. She would want to know the history and she had a few questions as a nurse, you know, when you are doing the intake for the patient, blood work, uh, preeclampsia assessment, or um, symptoms, reflexes, she's going to be doing those things, vaginal exam and um, previous deliveries, um, C-section or vaginal uh, for, since she has a history of um, diabetic and preeclampsia. And then the follow-up glucose if the patient was had. And then I think you were here when they're talking about from Mananyama Kru, they have an extensive um, list of things that they will be asking themselves while they're trying to figure out this uh, patient since the history is very limited. And when we have patients who have not attended the antenatal care, it's always like a puzzle and you're running against time to try and answer those questions. So if you can give us the background of that case study so to answer this question, that would be great. Mr. Jafari. I think you're still muted. Are they up? Oh, uh, how can you hear me? Yes. Oh, sorry, my, my, my network is not, is not so good here. Uh, as I can hear from you, what you, what you asked about this patient, uh, came with a history of uh, high blood pressure, and actually she's known hypertensive. So, by the meantime, when she was admitted, her BMI because he was not obese. I mean, she was not obese, and uh, during admission, and uh, the blood pressure was checked by using different type of uh, uh, BP machines. And it was just like that, which is was, was ranging from uh, 210 to 220 uh, uh, systolic. And the systolic use was ranging about uh, 98 up to 110. So when this patient came, uh, after this patient was admitted because she was in labor and actually was transferred directly to, to, to labor, with, especially with the, uh, the, the issue that she was presented with, that she has uh, reduced the fetal movement and she was taken directly to, to, to labor. With. But uh, she denied the issue of uh, having headache and our visual changes or right upper quadrant, those other features of uh, severe preeclampsia. Uh, and where vital signs, as, as you can see, it was, it was just severe, severe hypertensive and, and the positive as well, it was, it was a mild of a, a blood cardiac, which is also defined based on the blood pressure that she has. Uh, after cervical uh, examination, I mean the PV examination, the cervix it was already uh, started dilated and the effacement it was started to about 30% uh, effacement. And the presentation was cephalic and the, the baby it was also a bit high where by station it were negative three. So what, what was done is bedside ultrasound where the, uh, the viable features were revealed and uh, with a safari presentation. Also the measurements were still consistent with the gestation age of 35 weeks. And she had, uh, well, that's whereby the external monitor were placed to monitor the fetal outlet. Um, for Munanyamala, they were asking about, uh, does the patient has a history of convulsions, like history of seizure or complaints of? No, no, that? she had no history of, she had no history of conversion. Okay. Yeah. 
you guys do any blood work? Uh, because they were asking like a liver function testing, um, uric acid. Did you guys do all this um, urine testing, ketones and stuff? Yeah. Actually, uh, as a baseline uh, investigation that was supposed to be taken, mm -hmm. uh, those also were, were taken. Okay. And actually, because this this case, it's a... Uh, it's uh, it's uh, a bit a uh, long time, and uh, and uh, we, we are t as we are talking today. Yeah. This patient, uh, she was going home. So the uh, investigations that we are done, we are we are doing chemistry to mm -hmm. see. So the, the chemistry we are done. To, to see those uh, potassium level, LT, RST, and uh, those elevated uh, liver enzymes. But also she had no other features of that can leave that maybe she, she, she might have uh, any kidney injury or not. So by the meantime, she was also on uh, medication of antihypertensive, okay. whereby she, she attended the clinic only two times mm -hmm. and she was came as a referral from the, from the, from the uh, primary facility, which is a, a low level facility. Okay. And the good thing is by, it's whereby they were started antihypertensive already. So, when okay. she came in the, in the hospital, she, she had uh, adomet and nifedipin, which way she, she were used. So at least uh, they were started something from there. So by the time she, she came here, the blood pressure was still high, but though the tendency of taking those uh, antipertensive, which was not good as well, uh, that's why we, we find that when she came on admission, the blood pressure is was quite high okay so uh and uh electrolytes those were as i said is elevated liver enzymes and uh something else that were elevated it's where um i think uh, i should have shared the the results if we be no, that's okay. I mean, but if it goes down and it's elevated, then some time to, to check for it. Yeah. No, that's okay. So um, yeah. I'm going to have ask a, a quick question to Dr. Emma, and then we're going to go to the side. Now the patient was on the monitor. Uh, Dr. Emma, um, yeah. if the patient is requiring an antihypertensive during the pregnancy, have you used those medications before, Dr. Emma? Uh, yes, Aldomet and uh, Nifedipine. Uh, yes, we do use them uh, for oral uh, blood pressure control, absolutely. Um, now, if they do come in and they are already taking them mm -hmm. and then they're still elevated, that would make me now consider giving her intravenous uh, uh, antihypertensives. So something like um, IV labetalol mm -hmm. or IV hydralazine. Um, those may have a uh, faster impact as far as lowering her blood pressure. Um, so I would definitely want to consider giving her some IV antihypertensives at this point. Yeah. Okay. And Dr. Um, Benia's group, um, antihypertensive medications that you use, do you also use the same thing as um, Muhimbiri? Or also have you used the medication that uh, Dr. Emma just said, the crew from Mananyema? Just a quick. We use the same antihypertensives as Dr. Emma and Dr. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I'm going to share the screen now. This mom was put on the monitors. <laughs> I know the living delivery people will be start cringing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, hold on a second. Oh, there you go. Okay, so now, um, Mr. Jafari, if you walk me through and then tell me if I need to go to the next slide or uh, tracing, sorry. Okay. Um... So as you can see on the screen there, the findings that uh, have been noted when, when, when the, the patient was kept on CTG, then 
there is uh, not a good movement of the, I mean, good, good chart of uh, FITO at late, because you can see there is some gap in there in between. Mm -hmm. But the good thing is whereby we just find the baseline, baseline FITO at late, whereby it's, uh, it's 120, as you can see there, if, uh, if it's seen clearly. So the baseline late, it was uh, 120 bits per minute and there is a, a some minimal viability as you can see from the chart there and uh, uh, the pattern it's not a good to, to, to data mine and because she, she had also none uh, there is no a contraction that's we are noted as we can see on the the lower uh, the, the, the below chart. Mm -hmm. There was no contraction by, by mean time during the, the monitoring of that patient. And also, uh, as we can, we can just classify it according to, to this finding, we found out that this is in category three because there is a minimal viability and the fetal outlet is within the normal range, whereby the baseline is 120 and they are not going beyond. The, or, or beyond or above the normal baseline as one, 110 or 160. So because viability is there and sometimes it's happening when uh, 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 the baby is also something when the baby is sleeping. So you might find this finding as well. And as you can see, because there is no contraction, so we, it's not easy to, to determine that if if this, this finding, according to this finding that we have, uh, was there any uh, acceleration or deceleration? It's not so easy to, to detect that. So um, according to, to those findings that we can see there, uh, and ultimate fetal outlet pattern, which is, uh, uh, it's not reliable or predictive of abnormal, abnormal, uh, fetal status. However, there is a minimal viability without acceleration is also considering part for ongoing uh, some uh, hypoxia or a possible development of uh, uh, some metabolic acidosis for this baby. Sometimes you might suspect if there is a any placental insufficient uh, in, in this kind of patient, because of uh, history of also, uh, history of the, the the patient as well, because the mother has uh, high blood pressure, which is severe blood pressure, and uh, and this is also uh, we we can term it as severe uh, severe uh, I mean preeclampsia with severe features because the blood pressure only can determine that that's uh, severe features despite of denial of uh, having the headache or having a brutal vision or upper quadrant pain. So according to the, uh, this scenario, the criteria for diagnosis of these patients were, were a severe preeclampsia or preeclampsia with severe features and includes all new onset of hypertension and uh, blood pressure whereby it's, it's be, it's, it goes above 160 millimeter of mercury for a systolic and one millimeter of systolic. And this intervention were done, uh, this um, diagnosis were done after checking, uh, after, uh, after several measurements that have been taken at least within 15 minutes. And also after checking the proteinuria for this mother, it was a plus, Three as well, and 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 there is no any other signing for 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 severe features. So uh, the plan, because this patient, according to these findings, so the plan it was to start uh, uh, magnesium sulfates because of severe features and high blood pressure, but, so, but also to continue with, uh, with uh, uh, antihypertensive, whereby 
uh, intravenous hydrazine were introduced because of the, if you can see the, the um, uh, blood pressure of the uh, diastolic whereby it, it was 110. So, so we are given uh, hydrazine and so we are monitored closely to see if the blood pressure will, will be controlled or not. And this we are, we are accompanied by a uh, restriction of giving IV fluids to these patients, as you can see the way she presents. And also in case for, for the case of the fetal heart rate, the patient was kept on CTG and kept on monitoring and uh, for somehow uh, just changing the patient position as well and gave her oxygen so as to help the baby in circulation for, for the baby. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jeffrey. So um, hold on for the next part. I'm gonna go back to our contributors. So. Um, Let's go back to my nurse, uh, Professor Brown. So as a nurse, you see this strip, what are the things that goes in your mind and why did you choose what you're choosing to do next? Can you walk me through? Professor, I cannot hear you. Okay. <laughs> you see mute. <laughs> Professor, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay. So this is certainly a challenging patient, <clears throat> excuse me, and we would want to provide supportive care, make yes. sure that she's getting her medications appropriately, very closely monitoring her vital signs, and providing a lot of emotional support because I can only imagine how she must feel being in this situation. And that would just help her in the long run to feel better about everything if we can provide that emotional support. We'd have to closely monitor vital signs, blood work, make sure she's getting her medications on time, monitoring the baby appropriately. Okay, um, thank you, Professor Brown. Um, Name, are you able to speak? From Buguruni, are you able to speak? I know the Buguruni group who came in. But... Yes. Good evening. Hi. Good evening. Yes, go for it. Yes, good evening. Hi. Hi. I'm so, from Buguruni. What? Go ahead, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm Nema from Burundi Health Center, working as the midwife. Yes, I'm happy to be with you guys. Okay, so um, I know you came in and you, you didn't have the audio, but so this is the patient you put on the CTG and you find up the tracing like that. So mm -hmm. as a nurse and midwife there, what do you do? Mm. First of all, as a midwife, mm -hmm. this patient, he need close monitoring. Okay. Yes. Taking vital sign. Mm -hmm. make, sure, make sure that the vital sign is stable to monitor intake and output. Mm -hmm. Because this patient is restriction for fluids. Okay. And the... Uh, on this patient, I think the baby is not delivered. No, not yet. Monitoring. What? No, go ahead, go ahead. Yes. And uh, there's a drug administration like magnesium sulfates. Maintain those. Because this patient is severe preeclampsia with severe features. Yes. So we continue to give the maintain dose of magnesium sulfates and the hypertensive drugs. Okay. Yeah. And the monitoring of labor, maybe she's in labor and the... So. 
Oh, you said that's so? all? <laughs> okay, yeah. so uh, for magnesium, what is the loading? Do you guys do the loading dose and then maintenance dose? Yes. What, how much uh, is uh, Loading dose of magnesium is 14 grams. 14 grams is the loading dose. You give four gram IV and 10, four gram IV and 10, 10 gram each buttocks. And five each buttocks make it a 14 gram so if we want to give four gram of magnesium sulfate mm -hmm. here in Tanzania we take 12 mils of water plus 80 mils of magnesium sulfate then we give this slot in IV okay. for 15 to 20 minutes and if we give the loading uh five grams of magnesium each but actually we give five gram in each syringe we add one we had one mil of legal pain to be able to reduce the pain because this drug to cause a pain. That was my next question. I'm going to say that's five grams is <laughs> brutal on the one bad chick. <laughs> what? <laughs> No, I said that's what I was waiting to say. You are giving her the five gram on one per chick for the IM. Yes, I'm glad you guys put a lidocaine because that's a lot of medication. The five yes. cc, yeah, it depends if the patient has extra tissues. If they don't, yeah, um, yeah we give them a plus, yeah, okay, plus one meal to magnesium sulfate. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, after that, we continue with maintain dose of magnesium sulfate after. Every uh, four hours, alternating buttocks. Okay. Four. Yes, five milligram after every four hours. Okay. The maintain those. Um, Doctor Banera, so this is uh, a Banera group. Um, this is your patient. So, what exactly are you gonna do with this patient, and why are you doing that? Uh. <clears throat> if this patient attended at Monanyamara, we yes. would first give, give this patient or, or, or we'll do the the the, the bed right first. We'll carry the patient, capitalize, keep her business, and then we'll give her antihypertensives. We'll, according to this pressure, we'll start with the hydrazine, as you said, put it earlier. Okay. Uh, this stressing, we would just continue to monitor the the fetal heart rate and give the mother antihypertensive together with magnesium samples to prevent convulsions. Um, let's see. So my screen is frozen. Um, so Mr. Jafari, um, can you continue with them? Oops, I'm going back already. Your interventions for um, this patient was done, right? And then if you can continue the next slide. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So uh, uh, as you can see, as you can see there, that. These patients were also uh, catheter, were, uh, urinary catheter were also inserted and given a magnesium sulfate, so as, I can, as I said before, as a prophylaxis and hydrazine for blood pressure control, as, but uh, was also administered. And uh, a lab investigation were also uh, taken to evaluate if this patient has preeclampsia or was, Oh, she is just a, she is just a, a PAH, but also the diagnosis uh, also was supported with uh, proteinuria, whereby it was uh, plus three, and the plan it, it was uh, a panel whereby discussed about this patient because she's she's also a grand multipala, and we're about to. To, to, to deliver by cesarean section. But uh, this patient also, a previous pregnancy uh, just delivered uh, by uh, SVD. So 
the plan we have was to control blood pressure and to keep monitoring this patient as a matter of fact that the fetal athletes can be monitored because we have a CTG. So we are about to think on to control blood pressure first and to see how the fetal acts will be going and how about the progress of labor as well, the way, the, the way it will be. So uh, at first, the plan it was to do cesarean section, as you can see on the presentation, that's where, whereby the uh, anesthetists and uh, we, we are notified and neonatal, uh, neonatal care units were also notified because of this fetal athlete, the way it is. So this uh, obstetric and aesthetic, we are notified because by any time, if we can, we, we want to go for the cesarean section, so they, 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 they'll be aware that we have such kind of patient because she's, uh, she has high blood pressure. So after two doses of hydralazine, this patient's blood pressure were at least dropped whereby the systolic uh, blood pressure were we were 150 and historically it was uh, 70 millimeter of mercury. And this is after giving uh, hydralazine, remember. So, uh, so the, 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 given that the fact that the patient was a uh, grand multipolar and she's in labor, so she can, we can give her a chance to deliver normally. So because the contraction was not such enough, as you can see on the graph that we, 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 we saw it before, the decision was to give uh, oxytocin, whereby you give a 1.25 international uh, unit and titrate it against contraction. Whereby we, if we get a contraction at that time, then we can we can even uh, stop oxytocin and continue monitoring this patient that's because she, she was a uh, grand multipolar. So uh, that's also a done also to, to, for awaiting the blood, uh, the, the lab results as well. And the plan was to, to assess her again after, after four hours. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we can, we, can, we can go in on our next slides. Okay. I'm going to ask um, Dr. Banera's group, what are the things that you've been thinking from what Mr. Jeffrey was talking about that could be um, addressing this patient? And then Dr. M, I'm going to ask you next. <laughs> what are the things that could be done at that time when you're doing the interventions, thinking of a C-section and doing labs? With this patient, you're taking care of it. What other things should be coming in your head right now? At our uh, end, the first thing we would want to know the results from the full blood picture because of planning the cesarean delivery, she has a high risk of having thrombocytopenia because of her elevated blood pressure. But also, she's brand as para, so she's at risk of atony, and she she has severe, she has very high blood pressure, so she has. We are assuming that she has decreased intravascular volume. So if she any blood volume, any blood loss that should be cut would result to hemodynamic instability. So we prepare your for delivery. We also go for we would prefer to get a vaginal delivery. Thank you. Dr. Emma. Yes, I, I I agree with everything that has been said so far, and also um, that tracing that was shown. Um, I think I definitely want to see more of the uh, baby's tracing. Uh, it almost looked like uh, there was an acceleration there, but then maybe also a deceleration after the acceleration. Um, so I'm not very sure about the status of the baby. I would definitely want to see more of the tracing longer. Uh, assuming that the baby was uh, maybe category one or even category two, I would definitely want to give her a chance yeah. at a vaginal uh, delivery. 
Um, but if it was a category okay. for sure, then I would highly consider um, a, a cesarean delivery. Okay, so more tracing is like that one. So that's one of them. Ooh. And then oh. next one is that one. That's 45 minutes later, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then that's 15 what? minutes after that 45 minutes, that's the tracing. Okay. Yeah. Oops, so, right. uh, got you. So that's an okay. alarming thing. Um, I would hope maybe they had uh, tried to place her on her side, um, you know, get the uterus off the uh, vena cava vessels so that there's more blood flow to the baby. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, this, this is the kind of patient that you don't want to just push fluids onto, given that she has uh, pre and severe features. Uh, yeah. But uh, if the interventions are failing, if the resuscitation uh, interventions are failing, I would definitely want to um, deliver this patient by cesarean section. Okay. Um, Dr. Bernera's group, after seeing this tracing, what are you going to do? So as Sarah it was explained earlier that we, uh, for this case, uh, we would prefer more and uh, then uh, spontaneous vaginal delivery. But according to the trend of the fetal heart dropping despite the resuscitation, so this uh, to 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 uh, for the safety of the mother and the baby, uh, because we need to deliver her as, as fast as possible. So we need to uh, make a decision for a cesarean section and prepare and have a very good preparation for the, uh, for the risks that are in front of us uh, for, for the uh, cesarean section uh, plan. So by that time, we could have already have the future results, make decision if she needs a uh, planless transfusion, or if the planets are okay, if the HB is okay, uh, hemodynamically, the, her, her, her uh, pass rate is okay for anesthetic purposes. So this patient could be a good candidate for a cesarean section to have a safe uh, and a baby. So uh, when you guys are thinking of Dr. Emma and the Benera's group there, when you are thinking of either decision to deliver this baby vaginally or the decision to deliver this baby by C-section. Do you communicate with um, the pediatric or neonatal um, on the other side, just to make sure, because this baby is already compromised, mom is compromised. So do you prepare that team or you wait until the baby comes out and then call them? We can start with the- uh, oh, definitely. Go ahead, Dr. Emma. Yes, I would definitely alert the uh, pediatrics team to be available um, because uh, so many reasons. This patient's uh, blood pressure is elevated, severe range. Uh, I'm glad it's better controlled, but you know, it could be labile. Um, so that's one. Uh, two, uh, she potentially also has uh, diabetes. I think she has a history of diabetes in the other pregnancies. And that's one thing that I did not ask um, if anybody had checked a sugar level on this patient. Uh, is, is she hyperglycemic or is she hypoglycemic? Uh, but that's also another reason to have pediatrics on board because, you know, baby may become, may be hypoglycemic when it comes out. And then three, uh, the tracing is not the uh, a good tracing, so uh, baby may need resuscitation. Uh, and then four, potentially this baby is actually 35 weeks uh, in age uh, and not even 38 weeks, uh, or it may be growth restricted. So that's another reason to have pediatrics. So yes, I would definitely give them a heads up from the beginning. Uh, as soon as I decide I wanna do a C-section, I am also calling pediatrics and the anesthesia team at the same time. Thank you, Dr. Emma. Um, the the Monanyema group. So we also anticipate that the baby may, uh, may, uh, may suffer from the disease that the baby is having. So preparations for uh, fetal resuscitation, uh, or neonatal resuscitation needs to, to be done. So uh, practically what we always do, we have a station table in theater, in the theater. 
by by the time we are preparing that we 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 call the uh, the neonatal team in order to to prepare also the environment to receive the baby uh, for for any uh, for any uh, for further for further management of the baby and for any uh, incidents that may happen uh, when we we fail to to resuscitate the baby fully in the theater so that is always done. Um, okay, so for Mr. Jafari now, so this baby is going um, to be delivered, and this is what you guys have. So can you walk us through? Okay, yeah, uh, the outcome, as you can see, that the, the baby were delivered by cesarean delivery because of, uh, as you can see on the plastic chart, plastic glove, the, the baby was, it was about a category three because there is some type of deceleration also there. And the baby were born or it was uh, uh, three kg. And so sad that the, we had lost the baby whereby the baby was called zero, zero despite of uh, uh, vigorous neonatal resuscitative effort. There was no heart rate and, uh, and no more, whereby the session were done for 20 minutes, but unfortunately the baby, where the baby would die. So uh, after a discussion with the family, so we did a consign to the family and uh, it's a session where I stop to this baby. Uh, but also we are taking the, 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 the according to the arterial cord blood that we are taking, it's revealed that there is a metabolic acidosis uh, by the cord gas and it appears like that the infant had been exposed to a significant like, hypoxia for, for a long time and this involving uh, metabolic acidosis before labor. And on the basis of mother history as well, because she has a preeclampsia and, uh, uh, and, and a, a prior pregnancy had preeclampsia and she had most like to have preeclampsia in this uh, pregnancy and with uh, superimposed or uh, a chronic hypertension that she had. So uh, the obvious we had diagnosed a uh, woman who was hypertensive during the, the clinic. And we actually supposed to, to give antihypertensive earlier so as, as we can control the blood pressure uh, before she came into uh, labor. And as you can see for these patients, the, 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 and as she was not taken properly antihypertensive, as I said before, but also according to the findings that we have taken to this patient as measured measurement of the fetal heart rate, there was some kind of delay of uh, decision for cesarean section, whereby, uh, uh, whereby the as, as you can see the outcome that finally we had lost the baby and we had uh, a fresh stillbirth i mean the the uh, the early neonatal death because we had a we did a resuscitation there for this baby um okay so just give me an idea so since the admission to the time that the mom's coming to deliver how many hours are we talking about? And since the, we start seeing category three tracing to the delivery, how many hours there or the time span? As you, as you can see the, the tracing there, mm -hmm. uh, the patient were just admitted. Then we had the trace for 45 minutes later on. Then after that, we had a 15 minutes and 10 minutes. So, it's about one hour, the patients were just monitored in labor 
before this inspection were done. No, wait a minute. You said from the time you put on the monitor, she was monitored 45 minutes, what the previous tracing, and then 15 minutes. So yes. that's type of yes. one hour. We'll so is that minutes. continuous one hour or segment of 45 and then time passes and then put her back on the monitor for another 15 minutes? It was continuous because of the because of stress that uh, I've seen on the glove. Okay. So it was a continuous monitoring. Continuous, okay, for one hour, okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, so things that we could have added, I know you added a couple of things um, that could have been um, delay in decision making. And of course, these are now yeah. when we're discussing is hypothetical because when you have this patient, probably you have more information than what Mr. Jafari is sharing. He's sharing what he's going to remember for that situation. So and in real time, we know in OB, you are going to be doing the investigation over and over and over, right in and there with the patient. So you might have even more information if you're taking care of that patient. And always, of course, hindsight is always um, better than what actually is happening. So when we are thinking, um, I'm asking the Maranyamara's um, group, what are the things that you think you could have added? Not that maybe they would change the um, outcome, but just what are the things that you could have added in there to address what was going on with this patient? If this patient was on the mountain for one hour and then the outcome was not the greatest, um, what could you have added in there to try and change that outcome? Um, Anybody? <laughs> so okay, for 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 me, I, I think uh, from the start we saw the the blood pressure was very high, but yeah. the pulse was very low, meaning even the placenta perfusion was not right. So yeah. uh, this baby seems to had uh, uh, succumbed uh, fetal distress for a very long time. Because as we can see the CPG, uh, the, the fetal heart was, was hardly not uh, in the normal range. Because the normal, normal, we could say it's 110 to 160, but this baby, uh, uh, had only one the the higher the higher fetal height was only one twenty, so the baby had uh, fetal distress for a long time, and probably what we could have done uh, better is to achieve uh, the uh, the uh, uh, desirable uh, heart rate the maternal desirable heart rate. So, uh, uh, as we said, like the IV fluid was to be given, but cautiously. So, uh, achieving a desirable uh, maternal um, heart rate or um, blood flow would have helped uh, better to resuscitate the baby from the beginning. So, but also earlier intervention of this uh, fetal heart. By this time, as you can see the CPG, there was a time uh, the fetal heart was almost uh, 80 something. And the first, the first drop. So this would alert like uh, after resuscitation, this, after resuscitating this heart rate of the baby, the fetal heart rate uh, to at least a normal value, that was the time to, to, to uh, to, to learn for the emergency cesarean section and at least uh, get a, a baby and resuscitate the baby, not as uh, waiting for another uh, fetal distress to, to be seen. So I think we could have uh, uh, learned for a uh, cesarean section area when this fetal heart was uh, dropping and later resuscitated to a, a better uh, a value than. I think the plan could have been done earlier. The outcome could have been better. Okay, thank, thank you. you. I'll go from Mananyema. Um, uh, Dr. Msambichaka, I see your hand raised. Hi, thank you. Uh, this question is coming from a pediatrician, so I, I apologize if it sounds silly. But um, I was just curious, you're saying that it took one hour from the time the patient came in the door to the time of delivery, or what is this one hour range? Because I'm just wondering, um, I think 
is one hour delayed is is one hour considered delayed care because i'm thinking in one hour you are able to get labs to give blood pressure medication to bring the blood pressure down to like 150 and you went to delivery like within one hour or am i missing something so um just curious if one hour is considered delayed care or is this one hour from a certain like what are we counting the one hour from um my question mr jafari uh since she she was admitted until the uh, surgery were done it took just one hour because of the surgery we were just planned after after I revealed that the, the finding on the CTG, it was not fine, then that's where the plan of the section were done. So it took one hour to see the section. So, I mean, working as a labor and delivery nurse for a while, um, when the patient comes in, so there is that time before I put the patient on the monitor which you, where it's recommended to put the patient in the monitor as soon as you, uh, you have access to that patient because you want to make sure the baby is doing okay. So yeah. when you admit that patient and get the vital signs, their weight, their urine sample, they're changing the gown, you put them on, you know, like, you, okay, you're going to sit here, what's your name, whatever. That takes probably 5, 15, 20, 20 minutes. Now the patient is already on the monitor. So I was assuming from the tracing, I was assuming that the patient was going to be uh, that one hour is because you start to monitor that patient for one hour on the continuous monitoring. But that patient was there even before that one hour. And I think that's, uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, that's what uh, is yeah. asking, that one hour from enter the door to the C-section. From the, from the first uh, attachment of the CTG. Okay. okay. The, from there, yeah. Okay. Because uh, as, uh, if you remember, I said, so, uh, it might be also there is a significant say pox here, uh, which is also uh, in boric acidosis based on the finding that we, we had, which is whereby it, it might be earlier before labor started. Okay. Okay. Um, so, Bugurun, I see you guys out there. Can anybody has any comment if this patient was at um, your... Um, facility, what are you going to do? What could you have done different? Any comments from there? Buguruni? No comment. <laughs> no comment? Okay. Um, Professor Brown, as a nurse, was there anything else you could have added? And then I'm going to have Dr. Um, Emma add to it. Taking care of the patient with the preclamptic and stuff, anything that you could have done to add to it or ask the doctor? You know, seeing the whole picture now, mm -hmm. probably we would all think that we, we could have done the section earlier, but yeah. when you're admitting the patient and getting pieces of information one at a time, I think the decisions were good to get the, the blood pressure down put the patient on the monitor, see how everything looked. If you had done a C-section earlier, the baby still would have been compromised had it lived because it had so many risk factors and yeah. so much going against the baby. You know, it, it was really a hard call. An hour's not that long, but maybe in this case, an hour was a long time for that baby. Thank I do you. have a question though. When you have a loss like this in your department, is there any follow-up for the staff, for the nurses and the physicians? You, you mean follow-up? Do you help, what do you do to help this, the nurses and the physicians deal with this, to decompress from this? Uh, actually, it's a very hard situation, and sometimes you know when you care the, the patient. If you you care the patient even uh, half hourly, and you expect that this patient should uh, should go home with a baby, 
And unfortunately, you, you came, lost the baby. It's real hard. And somehow, uh, we, we are, what we are doing is actually we are just counseling each other on the situation that happened. And because what also happened is um, we had uh, some cases like this, which is the number is uh, quite high. That's why sometimes it's not, it's not my take that nurse or, or, or a doctor or physician that's attending these patients uh, for a long time to, to, be de in, to, to be displaced for a long time because of the numbers of uh, such kind of cases that's happening. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, Dr. Emma, if you can add in, and then I have a couple of questions from the chat. Um, I apologize, I didn't, my screen was blocking the chat, so I didn't know people were sending the information in there. Um, I'm gonna let Dr. Emma speak, and then we're gonna go to those questions from the chat. Yes, uh, I think this was a very uh, challenging case. Yes. Um, and given the uh, maternal risk factors, you know, all the history that we've had, uh, yes, very high chance that uh, this baby was actually already um, compromised by the time um, mom showed up to the hospital. Um, so I'm not so sure, um, maybe doing the C-section uh, half an hour earlier would have made a big difference. I'm, I'm not so sure that that would really have made a, 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 a positive impact. However, um, if a patient is having a persistent category three tracing, um, yeah. I would definitely want to act on it at least within half an hour. Like if you are doing the resuscitation and it's not improving, um, I think within half an hour, I'll, I'll probably be heading to the back to do that cesarean section. So this is the kind of patient that I would have ordered, you know, stat labs when she came in, not just routine labs that take an hour or more to come back. Um, and I would have acted a little bit uh, faster. And I did have a question about the magnesium uh, dosage. I think somebody, I, I heard somebody say they give, is it 14 grams of uh, magnesium sulfate? Because what I know is we give a four gram load and then depending on the mom's creatinine, you could give her like a two gram uh, IV maintenance or one gram an hour maintenance. Could you guys clarify on that um, magnesium dose that this patient got? Um, I think that was the group from um, Mona Nyamara. So uh, for us, as we know, there are two gui guides for magnesium uh, and administration. So for us, we are, we are using the Pritzer, Pritzer uh, guide, which is the loading dose we give uh, four grams IV, then five grams each butter. So it makes the 14 grams as a loading dose. So it's four grams IV, slow infusion, and uh, five grams each buttock, so making it 10 uh, I am in trimester. Now, is that for everybody with uh, preeclampsia with severe features or is this if somebody's having an eclamptic seizure? Because it, sem it seems like such a high dosage of magnesium sulfate. Usually we just give a four gram lot so we, we use that guide uh, for every, because we give magnesium sulfate as prophylactic and also in patients with uh, eclampsia, with eclampsia already. So for our loading dose, we give uh, the same dose as to prophylactic patients and to, as a treatment for preeclampsia also. But uh, after the loading dose, after the four hours, and after monitoring the, the magnesium uh, toxicity uh, uh, values like the respiratory rate, urine output, and bacterial effects, we continually maintain a dose of magnesium every four hours by giving intramuscular five grams magnesium sulfate each butter, alternative butter, alternative butter. So, after the four hours of the loading dose, we give the five grams intramuscular 
magnesium sulfate uh, in one battle. So in alternative battles, we continue with it. Indicated for the for the dosage. Do you also check the magnesium level? And if you do, how often do you check when you're doing the maintenance? Because as you said, 14 grams um, on the loaded dose and then five each every four hours is quite a bit. So do you check magnesium levels? And if you do, how often when you're maintenance the magnesium infusion? So for us, because of the uh, limited resources, we, we, ha we don't uh, check for magnesium levels, but magnesium toxicity. Yeah, we monitor for magnesium toxicity by the parameters that are said. So every four hours before administering another dose of magnesium sulfate, we always check for the respiratory rate as the complication of uh, respiratory, uh, the depression of magnesium. We also check for the urine output if the patient has adequate urine output or if we suspect there is some in, insufficient output, then we always do the, the four hours creatinine levels. And also we, we look for the patella reflex. As we know, magnesium, uh, if, it's, if it's in high uh, level, it may cause depression of the reflexes. So we just monitor those parameters because we don't have um, the... We don't have the ability to measure the magnesium. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I'm, so, and you I also did one, I'm sorry. I just had one more, uh, one more comment to say. Um, I am glad I could see that um, the maternal heart rate was also being traced the whole entire time. I believe that's the one that's in the 60s. 60s, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so that's wonderful because um, sometimes you may think you have the baby, but it's actually mom's um, heart rate. But I think in this case, it was pretty clear that uh, mom was doing something different from baby. So that was a, a great thing that you all did because somebody could come back and say, well, maybe you are tracing the mom all along and you thought you had baby and baby was already dead even before you did the C-section, uh, but you guys had it um, well traced. So great job. Uh, thank you, Dr. Emma. Uh, so the questions from the chat, um, I believe, is from the first one is from oops, uh, Dr. It's asking, um, what is the target for blood pressure ranges that you, you want to have, and how fast can you lower it? So as yes, the patient shows up, two hundred and twenty over one ten. Uh, what is the range you prefer the patient to have? And then when you're giving those and antihypertensive medication, how fast do you want to lower it? And why? Can we start with Dr. Emma and then Mananema, are you going to be next? Yes. So you definitely don't want, you, you do not want your blood pressure to be in the severe range. So ideally, you want her blood pressure to be less than 160 over 110. And so if she came in at 210, you want to go down to at least, you know, less than 160, but you don't want to drop it so low because a lot of these moms with uh, chronic hypertension are so used to um, living uh, with elevated blood pressures. And that's actually necessary to keep the blood flow through the placenta, to allow the perfusion. So you don't want to drop them so low. So I would say aim for between, uh, you know, 150 and 160, but less than 160 uh, over, you know, 90s to 100s, but less than 110. And you want to drop it down slowly over time. So I would say within like, I don't know, uh, 20 minutes or so. Um, but keep in mind, if you're doing the, for example, IV hydralysine protocol, um, they do have, uh, they tell you, you know, give the hydralysine and then check the blood pressure again. I think it's in about uh, five minutes or 10 minutes. And okay. if it's still high, give another dosage. Uh, so I think if you follow the protocol um, uh, according to the IV hydralysine recommendations, you should be okay. Um, Thank you, Dr. Emma. Monanyema, what are the ranges that you, you want that patient to have? And I'm going to come back to Mr. Jafari. 
So for us, uh, we would manage the, uh, the uh, blood pressure by giving first the IV hydrazine as our first line, according to the national standard uh, treatment guideline. So we'll give the IV hydrazine first five uh, milligram, then we will monitor the blood pressure uh, in 20 minutes, in 10 minutes, uh, uh, two times in uh, 10 minutes apart. But our diastolic blood pressure, our desirable blood pressure should be at least below uh, 100. So we will like to uh, repeat the dose after the 20 minutes if, they still, if the diastolic blood pressure still persists. But if it decreases to below 100, then we will continue with the maintenance um, antihypertensive, like we we'll continue with the ethyl dopa, or even add methadone if it will require uh, further. But first, we'll need to have a desirable diastolic blood pressure below 100 after the, the first dose or after the repeated uh, hydrazine dose. Thank you very much, Moranyema. Uh, uh, Mr. Jafari, on your facility, using this case, um, what is the desirable blood pressure you could have want that patient to come in with? Um, or if this is too high, how low do you want to bring it down? Uh, actually, I'm not quite indifferently uh, or far from uh, the previous uh, presenter from Manyamala that we the blood pressure that we're supposed to to lower at least it has to be in, in within a normal range, especially for these uh, pregnant that if you have a pressure below 100, then uh, and uh, the historic pressure below 100 and as a historic pressure, uh, which is below 160 for those patients who are severely high blood pressure, then from there, at least you can you can continue uh, monitor this patient with a, uh, a normal antihypertensive and you just take out from the hydrazine. So uh, the time that we expect at least to control blood pressure is also uh, equal to the animal as, as done, as always did. And we usually measure blood pressure every 15 minutes apart when the patient has given a drawazine injection. And also uh, after the main thing that we want to achieve in lowering this blood pressure is to make sure that so the fetal status is fine is, is, is fine because as you can see in, in the this case this mother had also uh, blood cardia which is a uh, sign also of, uh, means that the secretion is not fine and there is a big possibility that there will be a high hypoperfusion uh, the placenta whereby it can cause a stress to this baby and due to hypoxia, it may rise, uh, the baby will have uh, metabolic acidosis whereby this might cause the, the loss of baby as well if we delay, notice that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna go to the next question so we can try and get as many questions as we can. Uh, this one is from Samuel Mzamba. My apologies yeah. if I'm mispronouncing. Yeah, I said this is a difficult case. <laughs> uh, we don't, oh, what do we, what do you think we do? Um, no, what was the cause of acidosis to this child? Oh, okay. Uh, the cause of acidosis to this child is whereby this child were exposed to hypoxia for a long time. Yeah, that's why uh, sometimes uh, when the circulation of the mother circulation, if it's lower and it that's interfere the circulation also the placenta, and the baby will uh, will, will suffer for hypoxia for a long time and. That's why we can see there is acidosis there. Thank you. And then I think you, the other question uh, they have was like, did she actually have, um, I think you said the DM, I'm assuming that you said the diabetic mellitus in this pregnancy. Diabetic. Yeah, was this VBG 
also done to the mother? Uh, no. The venous blood for the mother were, were not done. Okay. But, but also uh, the, this mother had no uh, diabetic meritus. Okay. okay. So those are the um, few questions from the chat. So anybody has any questions? Thank you guys for your contribution. We were supposed to do the second case, but I think the time has gone. I think this one case, uh, we learned quite a bit and we're gonna find another day for that one. But um, yeah. we can all learn, as I said, sometimes it's easier to look back and say, I could have done this, I could have done that. Like what Professor Brown just said, when you are in it, you are doing it, the patient comes in, you get the history and stuff, of blood work, you send blood work to the lab, so the lab have to give you the results. You're waiting 10, 15, 20 minutes to get the results. You have already lost that 20 minutes. And then you start doing something else. Maybe the doctor comes in and say, you know what, you add this liver function or whatever, and then or the blood pressure is too high, give the medication, I'm, I'm, um, sorry, enter hypertensive medication. Yes. You are waiting to yes. see the result, that's already 40 minutes. So of course the patient is on the monitor, and now it looks like it's so long, but it's not long at all if you're in labor and delivery, because you're doing so many things at that time, staying an IV, doing this, you push medication, go and get the medication, bring it back. So communication definitely is important for this um, labor nurse or midwife who is taking care of this patient. To communicate with the physician because as soon as that patient hit the door everybody should be on alert so all the orders can be ordered once versus you order one and then two hours uh, sorry 20 minutes later you order the second things because that you're already um, running out of time and uh, as I said this baby was already compromised we don't know if whatever we're suggesting now could have saved this baby we don't know that sometimes you do everything you can but unfortunately baby does not make it when they're coming out so um it's a learning opportunity. So that's what we're just discussing and just to make sure maybe next time we can be more observant and more attentive to all those subtle changes. That baby has um, category three for, um, for a while, yes, but for a while that's one hour, it looks like it's forever. But um, we are grateful that Mr. Jafari was able to bring this case study so we can discuss and thank you for Monanyama um, crew for being adding to the, this discussion and your details, responses, we appreciate that. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Professor Brown, for your contribution. Do thank you, Dr. Emma, also for your analysis and contribution. I know Dr. Samichaka had another question, and then I'm going to let the um, few of um, you guys just give us the last uh, minute of advice. Uh, Dr. Samichaka? Uh, oh my God, I hope you can hear me. I think I, my internet is very unstable today. No, we can hear you, go ahead. Um, uh oh. <laughs> it's cutting off. <laughs> um, uh, as outside, I think it's very me. Okay, I would just write my comment in the chat, in the chat then. I My internet is unstable this morning. I can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay. I was saying. Oh, God. You start and then you disappear. <laughs> this very difficult case. Um, and I. We can't I, hear you, Dr. Msambicheka. Okay. Write my comment. Yeah, if you can write, that would be great. And then because that would be giving us um, like at least one minute for every contributor, then that would be perfect. And then by then we can catch up with what you want to say. Um, let's start with uh, Professor Brown. Any as a nurse experience and seasonness? <laughs> if um, in the future, what is the takeaway from this case study? Um, if you have to get this similar patient like this, what are the things that you can take over from now and then help you prepare for this? Uh, next person so hopefully we can save the baby's life <clears throat> as i said before i think all of the right steps were done you know maybe faster one thing we have to do is reach our moms before their due date and encourage them to get prenatal care because so much was lost with the lack of prenatal care for this patient 
And I know that's hard. It's so frustrating for all of us to have a patient come in that didn't get prenatal care because now we have to do everything in one hour that we could have had eight or nine months to do as far as the care and the teaching for this patient. And then my other takeaway would be to debrief afterwards so that just like we're doing now, everybody has a chance to sit down and talk about it and say, well, what would I have done differently? What could we all have done differently to maybe have a different outcome? And maybe there wouldn't have been a different outcome, but it should definitely be a learning experience for everybody. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor Brown. Monanyema um, Kru. Anybody? So, okay, so we are, we are grateful for this opportunity. Like we go to, to experience a scenario. This gives us uh, some things to always anticipate. But I think we also reminder to each one of us that prior our cesarean sections, perhaps in especially in these patients that we we carry uh, fetal distress and all that, we should have at least a, a Doppler beside our uh, data table so that we would um, confirm what is still present that we suspected hours ago. So I think it's a reminder to everyone of us that uh, being in obstetric means saving the mother, saving the baby in all in all ways, in all ways that we can we can go. So thank you for, for this learning session. And we are glad to, uh, to to be a part of this and participate more in such discussion. I'm gonna hold you to that because there's two more sessions. I'm expecting you guys to show up again in the team. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, <laughs> Dr. Emma. And I'm going to have Mr. Jafari last. Dr. Emma. Yes, I do. I do want to say that um, you know these patients with the uh, uncontrolled high blood pressure. These are these are very usually very very sick patients. And if you think about it. Um, if mom has uncontrolled uh, blood pressure, uh, then even as the baby is growing in her in the uterus, with this severely raised uh, blood pressures, um, it's going to affect how the placenta forms. The placenta is not going to be the healthiest placenta that there could be. So already baseline, uh, baby is not going to be getting uh, good perfusion because the placenta is not developed as it should. No wonder in this in this baby, it looked like it was already growth restricted. Um, so these can be very, very um, sickly patients. And these are the ones that maybe we need to act uh, on uh, more quickly. Uh, as a matter of fact, I do remember uh, when I was in training, uh, that was many years ago, we kind of had something similar to this case, uh, a patient that walked out of the street, no prenatal care, and she did have severe range blood pressures. And the tracing was also category three. And we quickly rushed to do the C-section, uh, but actually, you know, the baby came out already expired, uh, even though there was a heartbeat before we went in. So uh, these can be very sick patients. And uh, as uh, Dr. Brown said, um, we wanna get them in for prenatal care to really control their blood pressures because if you do control their blood pressures, the outcome will be much, much better than this one. So thank you for sharing this um, case, um, uh, Mr. Jafari. But also I would hope that you guys can um, decompress like Dr. Uh, Brown was saying that you guys just meet and talk about how you feel and you know I don't know distress because this is very stressful I cannot imagine experiencing these types of patients uh, frequently because I think they would wear me down and you know make me feel sad too so I hope you guys um, are able yeah. to process everything. Yeah, no, I agree with you, Dr. Emma. Yeah, when in labor and delivery, yes, we always focus on mom and baby, and we want to do the best we can to make sure we get the better outcome. So sometimes with everything we know, everything we have, and everything we could do, still the outcome is bad. It's draining because yeah. you feel like, okay, 
maybe I missed something and you start doubting yourself. So if those things happen a little bit more, people get burned out and run away from the profession. So we want to make sure like, yeah, you have that situation like what Professor Brown just said. At the end of it, like debriefing, talk about it. What could you have done? Maybe we would have this. Maybe we could have ordered all the labs in the beginning. Maybe we should have standard um, practice that somebody with a severe preeclampsia or severe um, features we identify on admission the next notify like i think Monanyema just said the group said uh make sure the doctor is involved early on not just hang out as a nurse just hang out with this patient and try to okay let me get all the information i need no if you are worried in the beginning it's okay i'm gonna do this and this and this so can you come and help me here because i have this patient who are, i don't think everything is okay so you shorten that time and then to try and give them a better outcome. So don't be shy to say, okay, I need to call the doctor soon in this situation so that we can put our head together and try and fix it up. And so um, that was a good idea. Um, we need to be able to be observant for that. Okay, so um, Mr. Pranka, you have your hand up? Yeah. Yes. Asante, Dr. Gaboni. Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, a very, very informative and interactive training session and that I learned a lot from all of the participants here and that I will definitely be here for the next one because these sessions are getting better and better. Asante sana. Karibu, karibu. Uh, karibu. Mr. Jafari, <laughs> Mr. Jafari um, <laughs> if you can give us the close out. So now for what you guys, if you did the debriefing and then what are the lesson learn from you guys so we can learn from what you guys discuss from your um, closing of that situation. Um, okay, uh, first of all, I would like to thank everyone to, for participation in this, um, in this session. And actually, after a long discussion, that's why it was just taken as this as a case study to learn on how to, to, to monitor these patients uh, from antenatally and intranatal as well. So as to make sure that every patient we, we, we have to save and have to make sure that every patient is having a, a safe delivery and a happy baby. So uh, according to this case, as we can see that we had lost a baby and Actually, the intervention that we are done is to make sure that every patient who came with uh, uh, preeclampsia or uh, preeclampsia with severe features and eclampsia as well, have to be monitored very closely. And if you have any kind of this case, you have to make sure also the uh, the NICU team are informed, well informed about the patient. If we, we want to, if the patient is approaching to the second stage or the patient will have to be taken to for cesarean section. So uh, this is a learning point for us and actually it's helped us to improve on some house in some cases. And uh, according to, to this case also in one way or another, it's trying to change also the practice that Every patient who is coming with a, such kind of condition have to make sure that they put on monitor whether either is using a CTG or is using a, a MOIL for continuous monitoring so as to make sure that the fit does, is, is totally okay. And if you have any doubt, then we have also uh, uh, ultrasound beds and ultrasound that can be performed to rule out if there is any other cause uh, of the fetal heart diminished or uh, uh, this decrease of fetal heart rate, whereby sometimes you might find there is uh, maybe a abruption placenta, so then you can detect it earlier for this kind of patient. And my, uh, my opinion according to this case is to make sure that we are taking a good care of these patients and timely intervention is supposed to be done so as to save the life of the, this mother and babies as well. Especially for those who are in labor wards, they have to make sure that the leading that the, 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 the leading that we see to these patients, especially for this kind of patients who are highly, highly 
uh, we, we said uh, these complicated cases, you have to make sure that you monitor very closely and you have to intervene according to the finding that you, you can see. As you, we all see that the, in this case, when we saw the first, the first graph, everyone said that I have to retain this patient and monitor the progress of labor because it was in category two. And after the second measurement and the third, everyone, it was like, oh, no, no, I was supposed to take this patient to for cesarean section so as I could save this baby. So as you can see that we can't just rely on the uh, just a single finding. We will need to have uh, several findings so as you can, you can make a good decision to, to this baby. But also for some hospitals like uh, maybe Monanyamala or Boguloni, but I know that there is no CTG or it might be there, but some of them, they might not have a, a knowledge to interpolate it. But they can use uh, even a, a fetoscope that we have to detect whether there is uh, a fetal deceleration or there is acceleration in between the contraction. This is also give a picture that this baby is, how the baby is doing uh, in the womb. So uh, that's my opinion. And I would like to thank you again and again. And you have to make sure that you're not miss this session because you learn a lot about the fetal monitoring. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Jafari. Um, in fact, you stole my question because I was going to ask Simona Nyamara crew <laughs> if, um, if they have the CTG and if they can monitor the patient continuous like what you just did. Because I said, yes, observation is the key and identification is even helpful you to, you know, like you anticipate what could happen to these patients. And, um, quick um, decision could save life. But as I said, some we know in lab and deliver, you can do everything you can, still the outcome is bad. However, but you did everything you could uh, versus not doing enough. So, I mean, that was an excellent case study. And um, for Monanyama, um, do you guys have the same thing like what Mr. Jafari just said? Um, as soon as the patient has arrived, do you have like maybe the physician on the maternal, uh, maternal labor and delivery who can you know like be around or somebody have to call you from Mananyama? Oh, practically, we, we we always call a physician when when necessary when there is some medical attention that is needed. Okay. But practically, we, we always attend the patients. Then when there's a need for consultation, then we follow. Okay. Perfect. Okay, guys, thank you very much. I appreciate for your uh, contribution and giving us the time to come and discuss this case. This was the very rich and um, um, provided a lot of opportunities so we can share our best practice. And then so we do have more OB um, sessions, two of them, in fact. One of them next week is the diabetic screening and um, identify risk for postpartum hemorrhage. And then the following week is also uh, for postpartum hemorrhage, um, how to address an actual event of postpartum hemorrhage. So we are seeking those case studies. I know that I've reached out to a few um, of the midwives and the doctors to be able to get those case studies so we can work on it and then bring them here. And then if for those who wants to present like what Mr. Jafai um, was the lead uh, facilitators, we encourage you to do that because we wanna learn from you as much as you wanna learn from everybody else. So it's a learning opportunities we're not laying blame. We're not saying, oh, you are late. You could have done this because usually we know for sure the more information you get from the patient, that's how the care is going to be better. So we can't fault anybody else unless you are there taking care of that patient. So it's a learning opportunity for us. And as we say in the beginning and at the end, we are all wants to learn. It does not matter if you have so much technology or you don't, but we still want to learn from each other. So again, I thank everybody for being here. And so let's go and save those lives on those mom and babies and take care of them. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody. Thanks. Bye.